Hi, everybody. I hope you're well today. This segment, Shakespeare's Body, has a, a precursor. It is going to be PG rated to the best of my ability. And if you do not want to participate, then I think you should turn it off and go to segment eight. We will be talking about male and female words, which basically deal with male and female genitalia. I'd like to start by reading you Webster's definition of body, which is humorously indecent. And that's exactly what I think Shakespeare had in mind. To start with, I'd like to read one of his poems, Venus and Adonis. Venus is talking to Adonis and she says to him, fondling, she saith, since I have hemmed thee here within the circuit of this ivory pale, I'll be a park and thou shalt be my dear. Feed where thou wilt, on mountain or in dale, graze on my lips, and if those hills be dry, stray lower where the pleasant fountains lie. Within this limit is relief enough, sweet bottom grass and high delightful plain, round rising hillocks, breaks obscure and rough, to shelter thee from tempest and from rain. Then be my dear, since I am such a park, no dog shall rouse thee, though a thousand bark. Shakespeare understood in the beginning, there were only two cultures. There were farming cultures and there were warring cultures. If it was a farming culture, there was a great river that ran through the country, such as Egypt has the river Nile. And all of the head deities or goddesses or gods were female. And all the symbols that reflected them were circular or O-shaped, representing the woman's part. If it was a warring country like Rome or Sparta or one of these, and they had no river, they had a fight for food. So they were always going outside of their country to conquer places where they could get food. And their head gods were male, and the symbols that represented them were long and phallic, representing the male part. In Venus and Adonis, a poem, one of the two poems that Shakespeare wrote, he starts off with the word fondling. It's capitalized and it has a quotation around it. So you can follow along. She saith, you need to know that fondling comma, Shakespeare was saying he wanted you to take your time if you're going to fondle. She saith is emphatic. Since I have hemmed thee here, within the circuit of this ivory pale. You must understand there's two important words, the word hemmed and the word circuit. Anything representing an O represents the female part. A hem, the bottom of your dress or the bottom of your pant leg is a circle. Since I have hemmed thee here within the circuit of this ivory pale. The ivory pale is metaphorical and it represents the part below the navel. I'll be a park. Park begins with a P, words that you should understand, and it's a playground. And thou shalt be my deer. Since the beginning of time, deers have always been able to multiply like crazy. And that's why there is a deer season every year. So when Shakespeare uses the animal of a deer, he's saying he's talking to you about making love a lot. Feed where thou wilt, another F word, and wilt ends in a T. I also want you to understand that she said thee and thou. The thee and thou are the informal and friendly, you is formal. So she's being informal and friendly and emphatic, wilt, on mountain or in dale. Mountains represent tatas in the ladies, and the dale again is below the navel. Graze on my lips. There's normally two sets of lips. If those hills be dry, stray lower where the pleasant fountains lie. You need to see and as a springboard. If sets up the situation or asks the question, the then is then stray lower where the pleasant fountains lie. The better part is what she's talking about. Within this limit is relief enough. 
relief represents orgasm, sweet bottom grass, and high delightful plain. Sweet bottom grass represents pubic hair. High delightful plain is a metaphor. In, in segment four, we talked about similes and metaphors, and we said the metaphor means the deeper truth. Shakespeare is saying to you, a high delightful plain is just a long stretch of body. Could be the back, could be the belly, could be a thigh. It's a high delightful plain. Round rising hillocks, hillocks were again the bumpy parts, breaks obscure and rough. Breaks is not a word that we use today, and it means bushes. But if you're doing Demetrius in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and he says to Helena, I'll hide me in the breaks. Notice he tells her where he's going to hide. To shelter thee from tempest and from rain. A tempest is a rough storm. Then be my dear, your sexual partner, since I am such a park, playground, no dog shall rouse thee. There won't be anything that will disturb us, though a thousand bark. Shakespeare's favorite thing to do was to end in a rhyming couplet, park bark, and Shakespeare's audiences knew that that meant the end. The reason Shakespeare wrote so many sexual double entendres, double meanings in his plays was because the queen, Queen Elizabeth, loved dirty jokes. She used to send the ladies in waiting to the plays because she couldn't go and they would bring her back and they were bound to bring her the jokes back word for word without a mistake. Shakespeare uses, like many other writers, which I'm going to try to prove to you today, body parts and their genders and their physical attributes to find the humanity and the funny. What he's saying is we all have them, we all know about them, and basically they're shaped in very odd ways, and he makes fun of it. He seemed to be most interested in female parts. Why? I'm not sure. Maybe he felt you had more and therefore he could do more. But there's like 48 names for the women's lower parts, and there's only about 22 for the men's lower part. For the ladies, when you look at the handout, Shakespeare is body, you will see a list. It's only a partial list. I would encourage you to either buy or to somehow, when we're allowed to go back to libraries, get Eric Partridge's Shakespeare's Body or better yet, Frankie Rubinstein's A Dictionary of Shakespeare's Sexual Puns and Their Significance. Again, one male, one female. Some of the names that Shakespeare gave the ladies were another thing, Baldrick, Bird's Nest, Blackness, Box Unseen, Breach, Buckles, Charge Chambers, Circle, City. Paroli says to Helen, you lose your city. He's not talking about Camden, New Jersey. He's talking about her virginity. Commodity, the bastard in King John has a whole speech on commodity. Constable, corner, any word beginning with C-O-N or C-O-U-N. Crack, dearest bodily part, den, dial, etc. I, flower, for fen, gate. You can read this list. Netherlands, O, peculiar river, Spain, treasure, <laughs> Venus glove, withered pear, just to name a few. Why Spain? I'm not sure. I've never been able to figure it out, but it's there. Men, you don't do so well. Bugle, dart of love, pike, pistol, potent regent, sword, hook, carrot, holy thistle, pizzle, popper and pear, my favorite, potato finger, prick, stock, tail, thorn, codpiece, instrument, needle, pin, pipe, the lady's favorite, three-inch fool, because the oldest joke is every man is going to say his part is 12 inches, and every woman is going to say, no, it's what we call a teeny weeny. These are just to name a few. And again, those two books, The Shakespeare's Body and Frankie Rubinstein's Dictionary of Shakespeare's Sexual Puns and Their Significance, they're dictionaries and they list all of the words. And you can see the size of Frankie Rubinstein's is very 
thick. So she has a lot of, a lot of, a lot of words. Next thing I'd like to say to you is that you must understand also when Shakespeare was writing, the Puritan revolution hadn't happened yet. It was happening as he was writing. The Puritan revolution brought about that sex was dirty. I believe Elizabethans had a whole different point of view and attitude on it. I thought they thought it was very healthy. I believe that they had homosexual, heterosexual, transgender. I think that their sexuality was all over the place. People ask me constantly, was Shakespeare a homosexual? I have no idea I wasn't alive, but I do know that I believe he was an experimenter. And if he wanted to know about something, I think he tried it out. He wrote a sonnet, Sonnet 135, which I'm going to badly read to you because it says his point of view about sex and bodily parts. Whoever hath her wish, thou hast thy will, and will to boot, and will in overplus. More than enough am I that vex thee still. To thy sweet will, making addition thus. Wilt thou, whose will is large and spacious, not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thine? Shall will in others seem right gracious, and in my will no fair except its shine? The sea, all water, yet receives rain still, and in abundance addeth to his store. So thou, being rich in will, add to thy will one will of mine to make thy large will more. Let no unkind, no fair beseechers kill, think all but one and me in that one will. I read this sonnet because here's a man who wrote 37 plays, two poems, and hundreds of sonnets. And he writes a sonnet, a rhyming couplet, 14 line poem about his name, meaning genitalia. I think he had a pretty good ego and that, or self-esteem, and that he knew that it was just something in humanity, and so he poked fun at it. This word exists today. Years ago, the late Robin Williams was host for the Academy of Awards, and he constantly talked about his willy. I feel that the majority of the audience had no idea what he was talking about, but if you studied Shakespeare, you certainly knew what he was talking about. I would now like to give you several examples of the multiple words that have these double meanings. Again, double entendre, French double understanding. You, when you play a double entendre, if you only play it for the dirty meaning, the audience will think that you're coarse and crude and they won't like you. But if, you, if you're naive and you don't know what you're saying, they sit back in their chairs and they go, oh, you don't get it. And they're very quiet. And if you want them to laugh, that's a bad thing. So an example I will give you is Bianca in The Taming of the Shrew. She comes home after seeing her suitors and her father says, Baptista says, what hast thou done daughter today? And she said, I was fingering his instrument and plucking his strings and stroking his neck. Well, she's talking about playing the lute, right? Of course. If Bianca doesn't know that this is a double entendre, again, the audience gets quiet. If she can play both meanings, then they find the, the funny. I will now move over to Romeo and Juliet, one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry, Juliet's speech, Gallop Apace. What I want you to see in this handout is there are three end stops, first of all. Cloudy Night Immediately is the first beat. Then she has a very long beat until she gets to Loving Black Browed Night. Then a short beat, The Garish Sun. And then I cut it off when the nurse comes in. Juliet has just found out that Romeo is going to come to her room this evening. She's very excited. She's talking to the night. Night represents the female, day represents the male. Therefore, moon represents the female and sun represents the male. 
So from now on, when you're looking at your texts, you must understand that these words have multiple meanings. She says, gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds, towards Phoebus' lodging, such a wagoner as Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Words I need you to see. Gallop means go up and down on a horse. Could be a double meaning. A pace means fast. It's a time word. We talked about time. You fiery footed, fa fa. It is symbolic, fiery, and foot represent an excited male. Steeds means stud. Towards Phoebus lodging, such a wagoner as Phaeton would whip you to the west. Phaeton stole the chariot. The myth was that Apollo's chariot pulled the sun across the sky from day to night. Phaeton stole the chariot but could not control it. He drove into the sun and was burned up. He was a party animal. As Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. My question to you is, cloudy night immediately. Why cloudy? Why not starlit? Why not moonlit? She's a young romantic girl. You must ask yourself that question. Spread thy closed curtain, love performing night, that runaway's eyes may wink, and Romeo leap to these arms untalked of and unseen. The first thing I need you to see is that she goes from you, gallop a pace, you fiery footed steeds, to spread thy closed curtain. She's talking to the knight and she's getting more familiar with the knight is why she changed the pronoun. Spread, double entendre word, closed curtain love performing knight, could be double entendre word, that runaway's eyes may wink and Romeo. Eyes, we said, also represented the female part, and she is talking about Romeo, and it is no punctuation at the end of Romeo, so it's an N word, which we extend. She could be saying, and Romeo leaped to these arms untalked of and unseen. Two unwords. No talking, no looking. Then lovers can see to do their amorous rites and buy their own beauties. When women got married and men got married in this time period, you signed a business document called the Amorous Rights. Amorous Rights meant either party, the husband or the wife, when they said, we're going to make love to have children, you were bound by this contract to do that because having children was extremely important. William had full license to write body. Many, many years ago in the Roman Empire, there was a man named Cicero and Cicero said there were words you were allowed to say and words you were not allowed to say. I have to break my PG rating here. One of the words you were not allowed to say was cunt. If you say it today, you can get in a lot of trouble. Shakespeare therefore said, this is fabulous. I'm going to say it as much as I possibly can. In Twelfth Night, the clowns put a letter in the garden for Malvolio to find who's a Puritan, who they hate, and who is madly in love with Olivia, his boss. He picks up the letter, he looks at it, looks at the audience and says, why, this is my lady's hand. These be her very C's, U's, and T's. If you miss that, Sir Andrew Aguecheek, a clown, pops up, says to Fabian, why be these her very C's, U's, and T's? Shakespeare is going to say it as much as he can. Again, any C-O-N word, any C-O-U-N word, has the possibility of being the C word. Lovers can see to do their amorous rites and by their own beauties. Beauties is capitalized. Beauties may mean your physical beauty. With Shakespeare, it also means naked. Olivia says to Cesario, I will give out diverse schedules of my beauty. She's teasing this boy, hoping that if she comes on to him sexually, he'll run back to Orsino and never bother her again. She's doing it on purpose, and that's what she's talking about. Or, if love be blind, it best agrees with night. What I need you to hear is the if and the unwritten then. If love be blind, 
the then's not written, then it best agrees with night. That's where the line lifts. Why is love capitalized? Love is capitalized because it represents Cupid. Why is Cupid blind? Most people have this wrong. Cupid is blind because he shoots arrows. People think that he shoots the arrows in your butt. No, no, no. He shoots the arrow in your eye and then it goes to your heart and then you fall madly in love. Two of Shakespeare's most famous sayings are, Rosalind says, love is merely a madness. Puck says, oh, what fools these mortals be. It best agrees with night. It agrees with Juliet. Come, civil knight, thou sober-suited matron all in black, and learn me how to lose a winning match, played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods. Come, civil knight, my question to you is, what happened to the fiery-footed steed and the whipping you to the west, which was very visceral? Now it's civil. What has happened? Again, words have meaning and show the emotional gear shift changes. She's changed. Then she says, thou sober-suited matron all in black, and learn me how to lose a winning match. Lose win is antithetical or contrast, and the winning matches, she's a virgin and Romeo's a virgin, and it'll be a win for both of them, played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods. This line for me is very difficult in Shakespeare's time when women were married to prove they were virgins the first night, the men were supposed to blot the woman's part after they made love because the hymen would have been broken and there would have been blood. And then they literally hung it out the window. That's what that line means. Hood my unmanned blood baiting in my cheeks. Hood is another word for making love and it comes from Hawking was the sport of the time. The king hawked. The head of a hawk looks like a male part. They would put a leather cap on top of it to keep the bird calm, and it became another word for making love. Hood. Hood my unmanned blood baiting in my cheeks with thy black mantle. Mantle is a shelf, something that you put on. With thy black mantle till strange love grow bold. Interesting line, strange love. Why is it strange? Maybe because she's never done it. Grow bold. Bold is a carpentry term and it means excited or erect on the wood when they cut the beams where it bulged out after they cut the branches off. So bold means excited. Think true love acted simple modesty. Then comes my favorite part, come night, Come, Romeo, come thou day and night, which in Shakespeare's time would have gotten a huge laugh. Today, people think they're really talking about the night and the day. For thou wilt lie upon the wings of night, whiter than new snow upon a raven's back. Come, gentle night, come, loving black-browed night. We said character is when you repeat a word or a sound. Petruchio's 17 Ks, Juliet says come six times. The words meant the same thing they do today. As a matter of fact, there were more words in Shakespeare's time than there are now, which have gotten lost, such as Roger. Roger meant to make love. In the diaries, you can go to London and read, I rogered my wife this morning, and we rogered again tonight. Give me my Romeo, and when I shall die. Ladies, look at your modern editions. The line won't read that way. It'll say, give me my Romeo, and when he shall die. Small death is another word, die for orgasm. So what is your editor saying to you? Take him and cut him out in little stars and make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. The face of heaven, the face of a building is the face of uh, the f is the front of a building and the face of heaven could be Juliet. She ends the speech with, oh, here comes my nurse. So in this speech, there are seven comes. Why? What is the humanity of this speech? My feeling is that 
Shakespeare takes Juliet from the very first 14 line sonnet when she meets Romeo, then the next time they're in the balcony, then this speech. She's growing up as the play progresses. She starts this speech out as a girl. When she gets to the thy, spread thy clothes curtain love performing night, she's becoming a young woman and going through her body for the first time are feelings about another person that maybe arouse her. I am no way suggesting that Juliet is going to masturbate. I am saying she's feeling sexual feelings for the first time. And I think that's the humanity. I have heard directors say this speech begins with gallop, two strong syllables and a pace fast, and that Juliet must do the speech fast. I again do not agree. Clarity determines the pace. This young person is experiencing so something for the first time, and she needs to take whatever time is necessary. I'm going to give you an example from The Taming of the Shrew. Petruchio and Kate are wordsmithing, and they're bantering back and forth, and they're playing. And I believe that for both of them, they're enjoying playing with each other. Petruchio says, who knows not where a wasp doth wear his sting in his tail. Kate says, in his tongue, whose tongue? Yours if you talk of tales, and so farewell. And she turns and she goes. Petruchio says, what? With my tongue in your tail? End stop. Nay, come again, good Kate. I am a gentleman. That I'll try. She strikes him. Why did she hit him? In Shakespeare, he who touches loses because it was all men. The touching was written in. Petruchio pushed the envelope. He went too far. He went into the blue territory when he said, my tongue in your tail. She smacks him. However, they get back on course. He says, I swear I'll cuff you if you strike again. So may you lose your arms. If you strike me, you are no gentleman. And if no gentleman, then no arms. Stage direction. She said no arms twice. So they disengage and he starts again. Harold Kate, oh, put me in thy books. She joins in. What is your crest? A coxcomb? The coxcomb is the top of the rooster. When men had a coxcomb, it meant the woman was cheating on them. Fools, all fools in the Shakespeare plays wear coxcombs. Fool also became another word for a husband whose wife was cheating on him. He then says, a combless cock, so Kate will be my hen. If the male part is lying in, the pubic hair, you could comb the hair. But if it's away from the pubic hair, you can't comb it. So Petruchio is saying, a combless cock, so Kate will be my hen. He's saying, you've got me aroused. She says, no cock of mine, you crow to like a craven, an old crow. Nay, come Kate, come, you must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here's now a crab and therefore look not sour. When he said that, and it was commedia, he probably pulled his pants open and said, looked down and said, here's no crab. She then says, there is, there is. Again, repeat it, gesture on the second one. And he goes, then show it me. Probably dropped his drawers. She comes out with the famous female joke, which existed since the beginning of time. Had I a glass, I would. Saying he has a teeny weeny. So he takes it to mean mirror and it's my face. And he says, what? You mean my face? She says, well aimed of such a young one. Again, if he's young, he doesn't, he's not to full growth. He says, now by St. George, I am too young for you. You must know what these things mean. You cannot just say them. Who is St. George? St. George is England's patron saint. He's the dragon slayer. Men have a tendency to name their male part. Petruchio's was St. George. She says, yet you are withered. Tis with cares. He says, it gets you so much. I care not. Nay, hear you, Kate, in sooth, you scape not so. I chafe you if I tarry, let me go. Stage directions for them jockeying for her to get, to get away. So the this, this scene is filled with double entendres and they're having a great time playing them with each other, jousting with each other, repartee with each other, 
as long as nobody gets too, too physical or too, too dirty. I would like to now take you to a contemporary play by the late A.R. Gurney Jr. called The Dining Room. In The Dining Room, two characters, Paul and Marjorie. Marjorie says, beginning of the scene, what do you think? There's three verbs that you all must have a very strong understanding. Think, imagine, know. Thinking is fast and fleeting. It's a weak verb. Everybody thinks. Imagine is stronger. I imagine you in a beautiful costume on a great outdoor Shakespeare theater stage. If I can imagine it, I can visualize it, which means I can crystallize it, which means it can happen. To know is toto, godlike, all-encompassing. It's the strongest verb in the English language. It also means I know Sally, meaning I, I'm sleeping with Sally. He then says, you're in trouble. She says, oh dear, I knew it. We learned oh, we learned dear, we learned no. It's becoming unglued, unward. I know the fa, I know the feeling. Coming apart at the seams. Famous joke. Do you think it's hopeless? Meaning, can he get his flag up? He says, let me check the table. She then gives him a little speech. It shakes very badly. I had a few friends over the other night, and every time we tried to cut our chicken, our water glasses started tinkling frantically, and the chairs creaked and groaned. It was like having dinner at Pompeii. Birds represent in England prostitutes. In Romeo and Juliet and in As You Like It, there's 23 and to 24 bird references. I believe Gurney knew his Shakespeare, and that's what he's saying. We tried to cut our chicken, and our water glasses started tinkling frantically. Glasses are famous in literature because of Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette had her breast to form the, the champagne goblet. It's the exact shape of her breast. So glasses represent that. She says, started tinkling frantically. Descriptive words, poetic words. You need to see these things. And the chairs creaked and groaned. Men creaked and groaned. It was like having dinner at Pompeii. What was Pompeii? Well, it was an explosion. It was, a, it was an eruption. His response, I'm checking the joints here. She says, it's all very sad how things run down and fall apart. I used to tell my husband, my ex-husband, she's letting him know she's available. We have such lovely old things. We should oil them. We should wax them. We should keep them up. But of course, I couldn't do everything, and he wouldn't do anything. And now here you are to give us the coup de gras, French word. How many times do they say the word thing? It's on purpose. Coup de gras is French. It's a military term, it means when someone executed and they shoot them in the head. But I think she's saying, and here you are to knock my socks off. Gurney was not sitting down, in my opinion, to write a a dirty scene. I think he was being very clever. Let me now use his scene to exemplify the word see. Character Paul says, hey, look at this. What? Look under here. I don't dare. I'm serious. Look, wait till I put on my glasses. Again, favorite female joke. She needs glasses to see it. Where? I can't see one. Under here, look, this support. See how loose this is? I can't quite wait. Come on. All right. See? Look at the support. I see. It wiggles like mad. Later on, she says, I see. That's five. Gurney knew the repetition of this word would be a character thing. Eugene O'Neill in Anna Christie, she says, you are a real seaman. I do not believe she's talking about the ocean or the sea. I think she's saying that the character is very visceral. Then he ends the scene. He says he's going to have to put a new dowel in to fix the dining room table. And she says, do you think so? Oh, sure. So, oh, the playwright is linking the poetry. In fact, your whole dining room needs to be re-screwed, re-glued, and renewed. Poetry, again character development, 
repetitions. Her response is, hmm. We talked about the consonant M. M being, it sounds good. It's Campbell's soup. It's mm, mm, delicious. The last thing that I want to do with this is this little section, which I find extremely important for punctuation and double entendres. They've been talking about this now, and they're coming up with a solution of how to fix it. She says, all right, and maybe you can cram a matchbook or something in there. He says, not a matchbook. She says, a wedge, a wooden wedge. Good idea. Wood represents the male. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, Demetrius says, and here I am, and wood within this wood, which means Helen has got him so excited he doesn't know what to do with himself. Again, referencing the late Robin Williams when he, when he was doing that Academy Award show. He also talked about his Woody, besides his Willie. No one knew what he was talking about, but us Shakespeare people did. He says, good idea. She then, please look at this, C, question mark, I can do it too. Monosyllabics, Anglo-Saxon words, which we talked about. I believe after he says good idea, she's giving him the okay to, for them to have an encounter. See, inflection of a, I can do it too. The stage direction reads, in her intensity, she has gotten very close to him physically. They both suddenly realize it and move away, crawling out from under the table on either side and, and brushing themselves off. She then says, so, period. Well, period. Will you be taking the table away, question mark, or can you fix it here? I believe her long so, one word and a piece of punctuation, so, she now is doubting herself, whereas before she was sure of herself. Well, she's searching for what he feels, Will you be taking the table away? Question mark. Are you leaving? Or can you, or, right hand turn, or can you fix it here? His response is very interesting. He says, I can fix it here, period, if you want. We said, with small words, if then. If sets up the situation, ask the question, then is the dare. Gurney wanted the character Paul to be excited and say, using energy language, I can fix it here realizing he went too far, if you want, that's what Gurney was looking for. That's character. You must obey the punctuation, especially when you guys get to your sitcoms. It's all important. All of the books that are being written on comedy for today emphasize do not abuse the punctuation and never rewrite. Say it and do it exactly as it is written. To make a point, I want to do a little piece from Friends. Joey, one of my favorite characters. Monica says, Joey, what would you do if you were omnipotent? Joey, I'd probably kill myself. Excuse me? Hey, if little Joey's dead, then I got no reason to live. Ross says, uh, comma. Joey, dot, 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 omnipotent. Joey cuts him off. You are? Ross, I'm sorry. So we said, guys, that Petruchio calls his St. George. Joey calls his little Joey. We also did malaprops. Omnipotent for Joey is a malaprop. With the body. The reason I bring it up is people, actors misunderstand things. I saw a soap scene one time when I was being a uh, director in training at NBC. The actress had to say the lines, omelets are my specialty. The actress didn't understand quite what she was saying. She thought that's what I'm good at cooking. Saying omelets were, omelets were my specialty meant that she's 
makes breakfasts. She's an overnight girl. She stays the night and doesn't make dinner. She makes breakfasts. When you understand the power of words, again, look at your handout on words. They're tools. They're actions. They hit a target and they explode in a picture. With the double entendres, the body, you're putting the twinkle into the performance. It's part of the formula. Sex, violence, these things are also, but the ear candy, the double entendres, make people want to participate and want to listen. So please study this and practice it and look for your double entendres. We've pretty much finished all of the small steps and the keys that you need to know for first folio. Coming up, we will be talking about rhetorical speech, which is the bigger picture. After rhetorical speech, we will be doing Stanislavski to Shakespeare, which will involve basic needs and basic doings. You now have, though, little clues. Practice them. I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I learn. To end today, we have a quote from Measure for Measure. Angelo speaking to the audience. See if you can find the double entendres. Oh, cunning enemy, that to catch a saint with saints dost bait thy hook, most dangerous in that temptation that doth goad us on to sin in loving virtue. Have a great day. See you next time.